Hi, I'm Art Bergeron, and the presentation you're about to see is the one that I would have done in North Pro, with, probably at the library, except for COVID, which is now finally kind of terminating. But in the meantime, we're continuing to do these presentations. Uh, this one is about elder law for singles. So if you're not Frank and Mary, but rather Frank or Mary, because one of you has died or you're divorced or you're just single, um, there are estate planning issues that are just different from what they would be if you were a couple. So you may want to watch this could be helpful. And with me is my good friend, Liz Tridiak, who is just going to talk to you about what's going on in July. She is a busy, busy person in these days. So what is going on in July, Liz? Hi, Arthur. We have so much going on in July. Everyone's back here, back in action, ready to see each other. Um, our bistro is reopened. It's Monday through Thursday. We're serving lunch uh, with weekly specials and weekly dessert specials, 12 to 1 every every day monday through thursday we have um well i'm really excited about this um it's national ice cream day in july so we are celebrating <laughs> national ice cream day with a big bash of uh, a sunday soiree of sorts so that is going to be on july 21st at one o'clock wegmans is our sponsor so there is no cost so people should give us a call to sign up and save their spot for that we also have some fun new programs. We have Beautiful Butterflies presented by um, Joy Marsloff, and that's on July 12th, and that will be here in person. And um, Joy is actually going to be doing some nature walks around our property with us later um, towards the end of the summer, early fall. So come meet her in advance on July 12th. Other than that, we have um, some of our other programs slowly coming back in. Belly dancing is back. The acapella group is coming back. Quilting, knitting, cornhole, um, trivia, all back inside the building. And we have a new art group as well starting up. So check our new newsletter that is out now for July. And I hope to see everyone soon. Bigger and better than ever. And once again, uh, if Liz, if they want to call and say, you know, they got a particular question or they just want to kind of come in and chat and stuff, what's the best number to call? 508. 393-5035. So there's a ton of stuff happening as there always was in North Row at the Senior Center. If you got any questions on my seminar, give me a call, direct line 508-860-1470. Have a great July. We deserve this. You know, we kind of made it. This is all exciting. Go, go to the Senior Center. They'd love to see you. Thank you very much, Liz. Bye. Thank you, Arthur. Hi, I'm Art Bergeron, uh, and welcome to this seminar, um, which I've been, this is one of the monthly seminars that I've been doing uh, from my home, actually, since COVID uh, hit. Uh, but through the kindness of, of the uh, local cable station, this program is being rebroadcast on local cable. So today's presentation is about elder law for singles. I know um, you may have heard presentations similar to this at the, at the Council on Aging or at the local library over the last several years. I, I tried to update it though to kind of focus on issues that I think are really crucial for single people. So uh, you've often taught, heard me talk about my friends Frank and Mary and, and, and the fact that the goal of these presentations is to really adapt your estate plan for where you are in your life because that estate plan changes depending on how old you are. Um, as your kids are growing up, when you're young, when you're younger and they're younger and there are guardianship issues and there are all of those things. And typically your wealth isn't as great. Your wealth tends to have increased as, you've, as you age. But of course also uh, at some point your income typically stops increasing uh, because you start, you're retired. So there are all of those issues. I often talk about how you adapt that to, Peter, to um, Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul and Mary Jr. Um, but the question is, um, what if Frank and Mary aren't both there? What if it's just Mary? What if Frank has died? And well, as far as Mary is concerned, of course, you know, she really misses him and, and she hopes that things are going well for him and the great beyond, or maybe not. Maybe it wasn't like a great relationship, but the point is that the plan in that case uh, tends to need to be different. Uh, if for Frank and Mary, their, their typical estate plan, with folks, I, I talk to a lot of folks, and their typical estate plan is very simple. They've gone, they own their assets jointly. 
So they've created effectively an estate plan, which is, which is if one of them dies, the other one simply becomes the owner of everything. Um, and typically, regarding the documents that they need to take care of each other while they're alive, powers of attorney, healthcare proxies, they simply name each other. And, and things kind of go along, and that basic plan can work for a long, long time. And I always I tell these folks, there is some chance that, that you're both going to die in an, in an accident the same day, but it's really small. Now, I've been doing this for 44 years, and I still have yet to find somebody that, to whom that's in, in, for whom that situation occurred. So now we've got Mary. Uh, Frank is gone. And she's trying to figure these things out, which she really e either didn't have to do at all or did you know, totally with a plan that dealt with Frank. So the, in, this, in our example, Mary is, is age 70, so she's, and she's retired, and she's fine, healthy, and the kids are doing fine, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. So what does she need to have? Now, before anything, and I talk to my clients about this, people who come in and they'll say they need these big estate plans, I say, what you really absolutely need is you have to have two documents, a healthcare proxy and a power of attorney. And you may think you have that, right? Um, but I'm gonna talk to you about that a little bit. So the healthcare proxy, uh, there are only a couple of rules about the healthcare proxy. Um, the proxy needs to be witnessed, the document needs to be witnessed by two people, and one of them, and, and those people cannot be the people you've named as your proxy agent. Um, the proxy only kicks in at the moment that you become disabled. So as long as you're, you're, unless your doctor says in writing that you're not able to make a medical decision, you're totally in control of all of your medical decisions. It's only if your doctor says that you can't do that that the proxy kicks in. The other thing about the proxy that, that you need to know is that you can only have one person named at a time. Often folks will tell me, well, I want all of my kids involved in my medical decisions. And that's great. And you've got to hope that your kids are all going to talk to each other. But if I'm the doctor, I only want to talk to one person. I, don't, I, don't want, I want the decision of one person in your place. I don't want to have to figure out an argument among your kids. So only one person at a time. Uh, and finally, you can always terminate your proxy at any time. And executing a new proxy always revokes all of the old proxies. I just want to mention one other thing <clears throat> about proxies because it's come up twice over the last month. And I deal with a lot because I do, deal with a lot of folks on, on, among other things, on Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. But certainly during the summertime, remember, your proxy doesn't um, cross state lines. A proxy that's good in Massachusetts won't necessarily be good in New Hampshire or in Maine. And similarly for folks who are visiting uh, Nantucket or Martha's Vineyard for other places, if you have a proxy from someplace else, it's not going to be valid if you have a problem on Martha's Vineyard or Nantucket. So you may want to get one done to take care of that. A couple of other things. Once you have your proxy, I often ask people um, back in, when I would do seminars, they'd say, so how many people have a proxy? Everybody raised their hand. So do you know where it is? People are like, oh, I'm not really sure I know where it is. Well, the, the thing is that you want to make sure that the proxy is available if there's an emergency. It doesn't need to be available when you're not sick. It needs to be available when you are. So, couple of things. First of all, you probably want your, your, um, your agent to have it. Um, I can't tell you, I was talking to somebody at, at, a, at a hospital, and I said, so how often do you call somebody uh, because there's somebody that's in, sick in the hospital and, and you know, you get the proxy is there and you, and, and, and you need to call the agent, and they tell you that they don't, didn't even know they were the agent, right? And they say, well, about 20% of the time. Well, that's a serious problem. So you need, to, you need to tell the person who's the agent that they're the agent. You need to give them a copy of the proxy. Uh, the other person that you should give a copy to is your doctor. Uh, your doctor is actually required under state law, uh, if he has the proxy, to put it into your medical record. And what he's probably going to do is he's going to, he's going to scan it into your medical record so that if you're at a hospital, no matter where, and they contact your doctor, your doctor can, can, can send the proxy to the, the uh, hospital. Um, give it to the hospital. Well, there are some hospitals that will take it and put it into your medical record. Um, many won't, uh, especially if you're not there um, because you're having a medical emergency. Um, so a hospital may take it, but the best thing is have your, have your agent have one and then have the doctor have one. 
The second document you have to have, you just have to have this, is a power of attorney. There needs to be somebody who you know can handle your legal affairs, whether that is dealing with the, with the, the financial side of the hospital or, or financial institutions, or with your banks, or with your insurance agent. You have to have somebody who is there to take care of those things if, some, if there's something that's happened to you. So regarding powers of attorney, uh, no witnesses are necessary on the power of attorney. And unlike the healthcare proxy, you can name two people at the same time. So you can name two of your kids. You can name them jointly uh, if you want to make sure, if you're nervous about this and you want to make sure that at least two people have signed something for you in order to act for you. Or you can name them jointly and severally, which is much more common. You'll name more than one of your children. Um, but you'll say in your power of attorney that they're named jointly and severally, so either one of them can handle things if the other one isn't around. Um, now, the, one other thing about uh, powers of attorney as opposed to proxies, and this is, once again, there's a common sense that if you execute a new power of attorney, you've therefore revoked the, the, the old one. You have not. You have not. So if you want to name someone new as your power of, in your power of attorney, you also should notify the person whom you're eliminating that you've revoked it, and you should also notify any banks with which you deal uh, or, or financial entities with which you deal so that the person with the old power of attorney can't use that power of attorney to act on your behalf even though you've named someone else. Uh, other power of attorney provisions, uh, you should all, if you have real estate, you probably want to specify in that power of attorney if that person has the ability to deal on your behalf regarding that real estate. Um, if, if there is a gifting provision, and oftentimes there is, you probably want to make sure that there are no financial limits on that gifting provision. You should talk to your lawyer about that. Now, getting the estate plan right. If you're, if you're Frank and Mary, or you were Mary and everything was going to Frank, well, that was all straightforward. But now what? Probably, well, let me put it this way. If you die without a will and you own property in your name, uh, uh, this money doesn't go to the state. You know, it, doesn't, it doesn't evaporate. There are rules that apply, the rules of intestacy, and the rules in this case would mean that your children would get the assets divided, in this case, among Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. equally. So that wouldn't be an issue. Um, to the extent if you have a will and it says all of those things, it's the same thing as if you didn't have a will. So the question for you really is, well, there are really two. One, is there something special about one of your children about, or about that asset division that wouldn't be handled correctly according to the rules of intestacy? Um, and, and do you want to adjust for that? <clears throat> so certainly that would be the case if you were not giving things away in equal shares. Um, it would also be the case if you have a child to whom you're giving something, but you think that might end up being a problem in itself. So if you've got a child with a credit, with, who might have creditor problems or might have spouse problems or might have disability problems. So for example, if you're concerned that maybe Peter's marriage is not so great and you know, you're not crazy about this daughter-in-law anyway, um, do you want to simply be giving Peter's share to Peter knowing that if there's a later divorce that, that those funds could be in play? Now, it is commonly assumed that you can avoid that problem by simply um, putting assets that would have gone to Peter into trust for him. That may not be the case though, and I think you need to, you need to be aware of that. Um, in Massachusetts, first of all, the general rule, the, 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 the family law rule, uh, if there is a divorce, is that assets don't have to be divided equally, they have to be divided equitably. And as a practical matter, that means that a judge can take into, into account the fact that one or the other of the spouses has other resources or may have other resources available. So as that relates to this share that might be going to Peter, if, if the will says that the share that goes to Peter instead goes in, tr to, in, to, in trust to someone for Peter's benefit, but the trustee is like his brother or his sister, and the trustee has complete discretion to distribute all of that money at any time to Peter, the judge may say, well, you know, when I look at this, I, as far as I'm concerned, that as asset may not be Peter's, but it's certainly accessible to Peter. The question is accessibility. 
So to the extent that this is a real concern, especially to the extent that you're talking about a lot of money, um, what you may want to consider, you may want to consider having a professional trustee as opposed to simply having a, a, a sibling as the trustee. Um, you may also want to consider limiting the trustee's discretion, saying, for example, that during Peter's lifetime, Peter is only, only uh, the only assets accessible to Peter are uh, X amount or the, the interest on the asset, some kind of control, or that only so much is, is accessible to Peter per year, or that he can't draw on principal. There are a number of ways that you could try to handle this. There's no, there's no red line here, there's no, or there's no absolute black and white um, that you can count on, but those are the things that you, you want, you'll want to be considering. Um, also, you may want, in that case, to say that you want to give the assets to Peter's children. Uh, we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Second, uh, so what if you have a, you know, one of your kids has a disability of one kind or another? Wonder, what if he's on SSI or what if he's on mass health and you, don't, and you want to make sure that by giving that child assets, you're not thereby excluding them from programs. By the way, SSDI, Social Security Disability Income, uh, does not have an asset requirement. So you can leave assets to children who are disabled, even if they're getting, as a result of that disability, a Social Security Disability Income check. The only thing that you want to keep in mind there is, at some point in the future, and if they're on SSDI, that means they're also on Medicare, so you don't have to worry about that. But to the extent that you, that you may think that in the future, they may need to qualify for mass health for some reason, that would be a reason for putting assets, for assets aside. Or if they're living in subsidized housing, if they have a Section 8 certificate. So you may want to kind of think that one out. Um, and, and then, of course, there is the child who does not have one of those issues, but just has an issue. You may have a child who had an opioid problem. Certainly there are a lot of those cases now. Uh, you may have a child who just has a creditor problem and is in the hole and owes a lot of money, maybe to the IRS. In all of those cases, as in the disability case, what you want to do is you want to create a trust, typically in these cases naming one of the other siblings as the trustee, uh, for the benefit of that child. Uh, but if you structure things that way, then none of the assets that are in that trust are going to be countable or lienable if those children uh, need, if one of them needs to qualify for a government benefit or, and they're not going to be countable or they're not going to be accessible to creditors, including the IRS, uh, if one of your kids has a creditor problem. So you can structure things that way. Finally, what about the grandchildren? Um, oftentimes folks will tell me that, oh, well, I, I'd really like to leave money to the grandchildren. I really want to take care of their college. And, and as we just talked about, in the case of Peter, if the, if the parents were worried about a possible divorce problem, there may be a lot of reasons for, for leaving assets directly to the grandchildren so that that's, those assets are not accessible to Peter. Now, and, and that may be the right answer, but you may want to take into account, especially if you're trying to do this to take care of college expenses, that when, when you, those assets, even if they're in trust for the benefit of the grandchildren, uh, those assets are going to need to get reported um, by the children or their parents when they're applying for financial aid. Uh, and if, in, in, whether those funds are in trust, whether those funds are in 529 plans or other plans uh, where you're deferring t the, 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 the taxes on the, on the growth of these funds, um, until, uh, um, so that the, ch the money can eventually pay for college. Those funds are all going to be considered by these financial institutions. So to the extent that you don't want these dollars to be basically dollar for dollar reducing the financial aid of these children, it probably is a better idea, to, or, or to, of the grandchildren, it's probably a better idea to actually give the assets to the parents. So th these are just things that you want to you think about, especially if you're Mary, and, and so it's not absolutely clear where the assets are going to go. Um, next, once Mary has figured out on the, pl the plan that she wants, the question is how to implement that plan. Well, of course, the simplest way to implement the plan, people will say, I just want to change my will and I'm going to put these rules in my will. And that may be the right answer, um, but it may also be an, an answer that you actually want to try to avoid. There's nothing especially great about going through probate, and I can't think of a reason 
um, that, you, that all things be, being considered, you really want to go through it. The bad news about probate is, it, it, while it's certainly going to describe or figure out who gets what, right? If the assets are just in your name at the time of death and they go through probate, before assets can be distributed according to the terms of your will, um, the creditors have to be paid. And I know you're going to say, well, I don't have any creditors. Well, that's great, except the law says that because the creditors have to be paid first, assets can't be distributed until the period for filing creditor claims in the probate court has expired. And that period is one year from the day of your death, which is the reason why probate always takes at least a year and a day. So that's a real concern. If you want to, if you want to, if you may be wanting to avoid probate. Now, uh, it is going to, it, when, when you and your, your spouse, one of you, you or your spouse died, this wasn't an issue, even regarding tangible personal property, the stuff that's in the house, because it's presumed to be jointly owned. If, if one, you or your spouse, if you die and, you're, and you own a car, it's presumed, your spouse simply gets the car because by state law it's presumed that you were joint owners. None of those rules apply though, uh, if um, you're just Mary and the assets are otherwise going to the kids. So if you want to avoid the, the cost, if you want to avoid the one year delay, um, then you may want to look for an alternative strategy. So you see what, Frank, what Mary's assets are. She's got a home, she's got savings. Her IRA or 401k, she's probably named a death beneficiary on those, so those won't go through probate. If she has an annuity or other financial assets, probably she's also done something about naming a beneficiary. The, prob the problem really is the house and her other savings. Those assets, unless she does something else to deal with this issue, are going to go through probate. The mechanisms to avoid probate, she could always put assets joint jointly with her kids. She could always put a, tr a TOD or a POD uh, on investment accounts and things. That's a, tr a transfer on death or a pay on death. Or she could put the assets into trust. Or of course, she could just give away things at the last minute. Um, for folks who are, who are trying to deal with this, the typical solution is a revocable and amendable trust. The nice thing about a revocable and amendable trust, Mary keeps complete control of the assets. Uh, she can cancel it at any time. There are no negative tax implications. All the assets are in trust for tax purposes is as if she still owns them. There's instant distribution after death because what she would say in the trust is, the moment of my death, this new successor trustee is going to step in, distribute the assets, there are no creditor claims, everything can get resolved immediately. So that's probably a sensible alternative. Given Mary's situation, she may also want to think about estate tax related issues. If she dies with a taxable estate of $1,200,000, um, there's going to be an estate tax. That's the amount, $49,040. It's not a gigantic amount, um, but, it's, but it's something. Now, by the way, you know, you, you've, I'm sure you've all heard, well, you know, if I have assets of less than a million dollars, there's no estate tax, so don't I get a big deduction because the assets are less than a million dollars? Well, actually, uh, uh, in, in, except in very limited cases, no. Um, the reason is your estate tax gets computed two ways, and you pay the, 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 you pay the tax based on the lowest computation. The first computation is using this estate tax chart where, where, where assets get taxed start, starting at $40,000. You add that up, and in this case, um, the tax would be that amount, $49,040. The second way uh, is there's an alternative way of computing the tax, and that is um, you say um, if you have assets less than a million dollars, you pay zero, but if it's more than a million dollars, you're taxed at 40% of all the dollars over a million. So for example, in Mary's case, if she had a million dollar estate, the tax would be zero. If she had a million one hundred thousand dollar estate, the tax would be $40,000, 40% of all the dollars over a million. As it happens, that's still lower than the amount that she would have paid if she had followed the chart. By the time she got to a million two hundred thousand dollars, however, and that's how much she has in assets, the tax using this formula would be eighty thousand dollars, forty percent of all the dollars over a million, compared to that forty nine thousand forty. So, so there really is a tax. The easiest way to deal with that is to give assets away. Just give them away. She can give her assets away literally the day before she dies, thereby reducing her taxable estate. And remember, there is no Massachusetts gift tax. And the federal gift tax won't apply to her because the minimum amount that is subject to taxation under the federal gift tax is if you're giving 
the amount that you would, uh, could otherwise give away federally, which is over $11 million. So there is no gift tax. That's the way to avoid that estate tax. Finally, if Mary is, say, 80, increasingly she's going to start thinking, oh, what happens if I get sick? What happens if I need nursing home care? I've got $1,200,000. What am I going to do? Because the nursing home cost is going to be about $14,000 a month. At that rate, money, money goes quick. Even, you know, her income is about a couple thousand dollars a month from Social, Secu from, uh, from Social Security. That means about a $12,000 a month burn rate um, or about $144,000 a year. So what can she do? She can plan ahead to qualify for MassHealth. When Frank was there, she didn't need to do anything because if she needed to qualify, she could, have, she could always just uh, move her, all of her assets to Frank at the last minute and then qualify. The problem now is there's no Frank. And the real question here is, is there somebody you really trust? Is there somebody you really trust? Because Mary here has to decide whether she's willing to lose control of her assets in order to, um, in order to protect them from mass health if she ever needs it. Remember, she has a million two in assets. One way of doing that is to simply give the assets away. Just give it away. Give them away. Wait five years. So you can give them to all three of the kids. You can leave them to any one of the kids. Of course, oftentimes Mary would have a concern about that because she can be concerned about the possible divorce or about the disability issues, about a lot of these other issues. Um, in the case of the house, if she were just giving it away, she would typically give away a so-called remainder interest in the house and keep a life estate. The life estate is total control while she's alive. The remainder is what kicks in after she dies. If she does that by, with, regarding the house, she has avoided probate. She still gets the capital gains step up, or the kids do, so that they can sell the house capital gains tax-free. And five years later, that asset is no longer countable. The, there are minuses to doing that, however, uh, because if, the, if she then needs to sell the house as opposed to going to a nursing home, she's going to need to pay a capital gains tax on some of those proceeds that she probably otherwise didn't need to. The alternative, which many of you have heard of and which you really should consider, but this is the balancing act. Remember, you can just give the assets away to your kids. The alternative is to create an irrevocable trust. Name one of the kids as the trustee. You don't have to name all of them. Name the one that you trust the most. Specify in that trust, distributions can be made, but they can't be made to you, but they can be made to any one of the kids so that during your lifetime, if you need the assets, the children can always distribute the assets to themselves and then turn around and distribute them back to you. Five years after you have, Mary has done that, regarding any assets that she has transferred into that trust, the trust that those assets are no longer going to be countable or lienable if Mary needs to qualify for mass health. So there are a variety of questions that Mary needs to ask herself. The key to the answer of those questions is, what's going to cause her to lose sleep? People will often ask me, well, you know, Attorney Bergeron, you know, we've talked to you about my plan. What do you, what do you, what would, what would you do? And I tell people, I would do the thing that helps me sleep at night. That may be different from what helps you sleep at night. If you have, if you have a mass health concern, an asset protection concern, and you have a trusted child, you can just give the assets to them. If you have a group of children and you're afraid that they might fight about this, you might give the assets to, hit to the trusted child as the trustee of an irrevocable trust. If you're okay with just leaving assets when you die to your kids, that's great. If one of them has a problem and you're worried about that, you can deal with that through your estate plan. Pro going, having your assets go through probate will always work, but it's going to cost money that otherwise could be saved and it's going to cost a lot of time. Does that bother you or would you rather know that if you died, your, your kids are going to be able to handle this very easily. So the question is, what helps you sleep at night? If you want to see this presentation again or any of my presentation, you can go to our YouTube channel, Elder Law Frank and Mary, uh, uh, or give me a call. My, my, my uh, direct line is 508-860-1470. Thank you very much, and I'll talk to you next month.